Okay, so, as we saw last week, the role of the mass media was to harness audiences together as a commodity to be sold as a group, huge amounts of people together in order to sell that number to a potential set of advertisers. In the digital era, advertisers don't work in this way. Advertisers instead are buying a very particular form of engagement, attention. I'm having a percussion session here as well. This is neat. So, what does that mean in practice? You could have been watching a television programme many, many years ago and be part of a wider audience for it. But you could just as easily have been having a television on and not paying any attention to this whatsoever. Digital media companies know what you are paying attention to. They measure it and quantify it very carefully. When you're scrolling through Instagram, they know what you stop on. They measure how long you scroll for and how long you stop for. It's a crude measure of attention. This doesn't necessarily mean you're looking at your screen. You could have just stopped and might be doing something else at the same time. But there's a very good chance that you are paying attention to a particular post. And then they can assess what is the content of that post. And through repeated measures of this kind of behaviour, they can gain a very close indication of what your interests are. Or what things can be targeted at you which you will find attractive. Through that, you have a very fine-grained set of data about what people pay attention to. Attention becomes the critical commodity in the digital media environment. And we're kind of taught this as producers as well. When you get onto production modules in this degree, you're going to start being told that you've got to grasp people's attention. What do you do? Because the whole digital media landscape is about pulling attention. The more attention your work gets, the more money it will attract from the platforms that it sits there. It is no accident that those who can monetize social media accounts, or we would usually call influencers, have one commodity which other users don't, and that is that they create a demand for attention. People pay attention to their content over others. If you want to become an influencer, do something better with your life. Go work for a fucking charity or something. Help children. Go volunteer for the RSPCA. There's dogs that have been abandoned. Go look after the dogs. Don't be an influencer. Influencers make masturbation look like a spiritual quest. Okay? They're the worst. But what they do is very, very simple to understand. They dominate attention on platforms. <coughs> Companies can identify who dominates attention on platforms and monetize that attention capture accordingly. What is important to note is that nearly all influencers get screwed. If you are being paid for content, I can guarantee you that the company that is paying you or the platform that is paying you is making triple what you are on that content itself. And that even goes for the big, big influencers. Kylie Jenner earns a lot of money on Instagram. Instagram earns a shit ton more money out of Kylie Jenner, I can assure you. So, all of this work that you do is sold. Everything. The attention that you pay to content is sold off. And this is the difference between old media and digital media. Attention can be quantified much more closely, much more specifically. Your interests and what you want and what you like can be targeted in ways that were simply impossible in the broadcast era. In the broadcast mass media era, yes, newspaper might sell 3 million copies a day. You know roughly the kinds of demographics of people who are buying the newspaper so you can sell advertising to them. Today, 
You don't have to behave in that way. You can know exactly what I like. Exactly the things that I search for. Exactly the things that I want. And it works in really interesting ways, right? So you're all familiar with looking for something on Amazon and then you get a bunch of suggestions underneath. You know, about like, people who bought this product previously also bought this. That's nonsense. Amazon are using their history of you as a consumer to predict what you will buy next. It's like, you know, people, you're looking at a Justin Bieber album and like, people who bought this also bought a stool and a rope. You know? um, and, and, you know, and things like this happen all the time, right? So, all our interactions go into this. This effectively is what is called the attention economy. And the effect is to capture extreme amounts of information which are made valuable through use. <coughs> Hypothetically, we should be able to target all the members of a peer group just as they're forming their opinions about brands, habits, and so on. As digital media use becomes ubiquitous, and we start using digital media younger and younger, you can capture information before people's impressions of the world themselves have formed. And on the flip side of this, you can start targeting them with content to shape their impressions and their understanding of the world as well, which is basically the TikTok slash YouTube model, where you start pushing content in order to shape opinion in order to make people into nice little easy to understand units of information in the future. You simplify human beings in order to make them more valuable effectively. Because complex, it's hard to get to grips with. Complex people are all over the place. Simple people, simple to deal with. The king, the king of them all is meta. They are the best at doing this. They, I will give them credit, they're evil, but they're, at least they're good at evil. Extremely good at evil. Mark Zuckerberg looks evil. His head has an evil shape about it. Um, online advertising is the mechanism by which Meta exploits its users. So under the conditions of use of not just a platform, but several platforms, most users become part of a creative, precarious underclass of labourers whose work is dictated by and for the benefit of the platform they use. Everything you do on their platforms is by design. The interface of Instagram is specifically designed in order to, for people to create a particular kind of content. They've created a social norm of actually posting on Instagram. You know, the, you know, there's a difference between what you might put on Snap and Instagram, yeah? That is a created norm. That makes Instagram as a platform more valuable. If people only post things prestigiously on Instagram, it itself has a prestige to it, which it can sell to its advertising partners. And as my friend Kylie uh, argues, the immaterial labour that is used by social media is akin to a form of unpaid domestic labour. Kylie says we are all digital housewives. We work and work and work and get no recognition for it and get no payment for it. And this economy is basically dominated by a few companies that use the notion of sharing for mystifying the logic of how they make profit. Because we all live in a sharing world now where we share images and we, and we like what our friends post on social media and we leave nice comments. And every bit of that is monetized <laughs> for profit. Everything that you do is monetized for profit. It is mined, it is sold. But it's nice to be nice. Christian Fuchs in 2015 uh, summarizes why this is so problematic. We can substitute Meta for any other company yet. Meta is a company controlled by private shareholders who own those platforms. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. Meta's users create data whenever they're online. And I mean that, whenever they're online. Don't have to be on those platforms. Meta uses sophisticated tracking all across the web in order to assess where, what we're doing at that point in time. 
That data is sold to Meta's advertising clients who are able to present targeted advertising on our profiles. We're clear so far. Here's the kick. Without us, there would be no profit in the first place. All the value of those platforms comes from us. There is no inherent value in this platform whatsoever. If there's no users, there is nothing. Nothing happens, it is a vacuum, no information, no profit to be had. Nothing to sell without our activity. Everything is what we do. If we all left today, that company would go bankrupt instantly. And I do mean absolutely instantly. Zuckerberg would be out on his sorry ass living on the streets of Boston tomorrow if we all deleted our accounts today. Users create the monetary value and profit, but they do not own this profit. That is controlled by the shareholders. Everything that company makes goes to those people. Primary shareholder of Meta, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg. So we are exploited and we are locked out of everything. All of our labour comes to nothing, and we don't even get a share of the profits of the company that we do all the work for, gets. Now, if Meta was run in a different way, you could quite easily envisage a company that makes a large amount of profit, but then distributes that profit back to its users. There is nothing inherently wrong with that model. We wouldn't get much, I'm not claiming that we would. We'd all get a few bucks a year, and we'd all probably feel better about ourselves. We'll get a tenner, you know, it's a couple of pints. Be quite pleased with that, you know? It's a few more bags of those crisps that I like, those hot watts You know, they're pretty sweet. That's my Instagram money for the year. But I get nothing. Nobody gets anything. And here comes the question, like, me, 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 me. People monetize to uh, uh, influencers, man, man, man. 99.9999999999% of people on Instagram get nothing. The number of people who monetize content on Instagram is incredibly small for a platform that has over a billion users. We are talking in the thousands out of billions. Throwing a bone to a few people is not a share of the profits. So, we're actually double objects of commodification. Not only is our consciousness and attention made into a commodity, but then they've got the fucking cheek to sell us stuff afterwards to the partners, to the people who are actually giving them money. They put adverts on our feeds. So we're commodified twice. Firstly, our data is used, commodity one, and then commodity two, we're now customers for these jokers as well. We're being sold at stuff at the same time as we're being sold. That's called a double object of commodification. In the digital world, lovely. So many people in this room want to work for Instagram. Or want to work for these companies. It's very wrong to suggest that Facebook is an outlier in this. I don't want to pick on Facebook on their own. They're big boys and they can handle it. Nobody gives a shit. People, I've been doing lectures like this for a long, long time. I've written about this in books. Facebook couldn't give a fuck. Okay? Google are even fucking worse than Facebook. Even more evil. They're not quite as good at evil. That's their problem. But they are pretty evil. Facebook don't just want to sell you things. They want to control what you do. Just as I gave you the example of Pokemon Go from Niantic, a spin-off company from Google itself, the whole purpose of Niantic was to drive people into particular areas in order for them to be more effectively sold products. Facebook has one model of doing things, but Google's model is not about just selling. Yeah, they want to sell you stuff, but they also want to control what you actually do. And that can be a little bit hard to understand. This is called biopolitical exploitation. And the concept of biopower here is very, very important. So, 
biopower is a concept used by uh, Michel Foucault, referring to the techniques used in his case by states to subjugate and control human beings. In Foucault's writing, he detailed how countries would use bureaucracy to control people in the state. They would classify us in particular ways, they would make us do things in particular ways, the country itself operates as a series of bureaucratic systems that control how people act in a society. So you have the bureaucracy of councils, for example. If you want to live somewhere, you have to report to the council. They will have a record of you. They will then charge you for services in that area, and they will continually keep a record of this. And at the same time, if you have children, you've got to put them in a school, so your children are classified in particular ways. And these forces are disciplinary as well. If you choose not to pay, then you're in trouble. If you choose not to send your kids to school, you're in trouble. If your kids are little fucks, you're in trouble because the school will know about it. And you can't be bad, you've got to be good. Then you've got to go into the school and you've got to go, no, 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 Michael is disruptive in class. And it's like, yeah, I get that. Um, a whole series of bureaucracies exist and exert power over us, according to Foucault. This is called biopower. It is the disciplining of bodies in particular ways. Um, basically, we are shaped and moulded by all the external forces that come onto us to make us into good little girls and boys. Google operates as a form of digital biopower because it shapes what we can and can't do with digital information. You think, what? I said, Try searching for something. Google is telling you what to know. You search for something, you trust Google, right? I mean, you trust Google, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Google's a privately owned company whose impulse is to make money off you. But we trust we hit the search, and up it comes. And I'm like, I shall go into this. And then you, but this must be the, the best explanation, because this is the first one on the page. Right? Well, it's the first one on the page, because usually that organization has had something to do with Google as a commercial entity. Adverts on pages are positioned in that way because of the relationship between the advertiser and Google as a platform. This is no surprise to anyone, right? Shit. <laughs> How does this work? Um, biopower is not something which is direct on us, it is the environment around us. And Google as an organisation, because of the way it works, operates in a biopower way. So Google's vision is one where the world is made completely knowable, controllable, and predictable. If you collect enough information about people and start using that information to direct people towards particular solutions, you can make people more predictable. In Google's eyes, making people more predictable makes the world safer, and it makes the world easier to navigate. People will be if everyone is predictable. <sighs> if Ben Morozov calls this technological solutions, it is the idea that you can fix the world's problems just by applying technology to it. That all the world's problems can be solved if you just have the right technological solution to it. Spoiler alert, anything that is technologically solutionist <coughs> is total and utter bollocks from beginning to end. Technology does not solve problems, technology creates problems. Usually, a, technological, a technological solutionism approach will create a whole set of different issues to the problem that you are actually trying to solve. Just like Google's control of search has made them into this vast data enterprise, which now looks to control everyday life, and is in bed with just about every major government in the world as well, which means that if you are a naughty boy or girl, you are going to get in a lot of trouble. So, Solutionism recasts all complex problems as something that can be solved in a simple way, in this case by technology. And literally, Google's mission statement these days is to make all of knowledge available and controllable. 
in order to make the world a better place. That is in there, in their mission statement. So basically, Google want to be God at the end of the day. Typical ideology of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and intellectuals who glorify digital media as being a solution to problems and not the root of problems. Deeply, deeply problematic. Scott Galloway uses this analogy of God to describe the kind of power that Google wants in society. It wants to be able to predict everything. The power desired by Google is not of what we do, but also what we want to do. Google's aim is to stockpile information and use that information to build artificial models of mind that can be used to predict the actions of different people. Google want to know when you're 10 if you're going to blow up a building when you're 20. That's their aim. They want to know who the psychos are. They want to know who the perverts are. They want to know who the deviants are. But they also want to know who the normals are. They want to know who everyone is. They want to be able to predict exactly who you will become. Google knows as we walk through the mall, we want headphones. We want pumps. We have a thing for girls with tattoos. Google knows all this. Things that Google knows about me are deeply, deeply worrying. Now, Google knows more about me than me, right? <laughs> about the sublimation of my perversions. So, Google don't want to track every individual. Google insinuates itself into the intimate lives of each and every person. They can form a kind of cybernetic governmentality. What that means is, if you have enough information about enough people of much across an entire society, you can start to govern that society. And you govern by pushing and nudging people towards particular ways of action in everyday life and away from other kinds. Governance of this kind is not about you know, Google or being elected. No, no, no. This is not democratic. Cybernetic governmentality is about controlling the kinds of choices and therefore the kinds of actions that we can perform. The very notion of biopower, that things that are around you, bureaucracies and the state, would control how people behave. Google wants to be able to do this to us in everyday life. How does it do this? Well, basically by destroying any notion of privacy. Everything that you collect, everything that you perform, everything that you do. Um, anyone use incognito mode on their phone to browse? No, oh, don't bother. It's a complete waste of time. What? There is that no... private browser? Yeah, it's a total waste of time. I've never heard of anything so absurd in all my life, quite frankly. Um, and if you're talking, what about DuckDuckGo? <laughs> Please, come back to kindergarten, right? <laughs> Don't be so silly. Um, businesses like this are making money by surveilling everything that we do. Unsurprisingly, this business model has been called surveillance capitalism. The whole root of the capitalistic drive to make profit here is by collecting as much information as possible. That is a form of surveillance. Now, you can inform yourself about this stuff. All those terms and conditions that you don't read, and you just press the tick, it's all in there. The only problem with terms and conditions documents is that you need like an advanced degree in company law to understand what the hell they say, and hours to read them, because they're usually about 50 pages long as well. And the clauses about security are usually buried deeply in some other clause in it as well. They pay a lot of money to a lot of very smart lawyers in order to be able to put this in a way that nobody's ever going to object to. And as soon as you actually get round to reading it and making a decision on it, well, guess what? It's changed. <laughs> Terms of, you know, you see this all the time. Terms and conditions on this app have changed. Do you accept? You just open the fucking app, yeah? Yeah, and you've now accepted that you are going to be part of a human centipede or something like that, because that's in the terms and conditions, right? So, 
we basically wave through surveillance. There, there might be an impression that you know, we're not in favour of this. But you've agreed to it. Everyone who has signed up to an account with a digital media company has agreed to allow them to do this. That is the point of accepting the terms and conditions. You said, yeah, those web pages you go on and it says like, do you accept the cookies and you just, God, just, yeah, I just want to read this thing? You've accepted that they are going to monetize your presence on that web page. You said, okay, there's no recourse to anything here. You've said, okay, that you're not going to be paid for this. You're not going to get anything back. You're, you're fine with it. We can still mop. But, but we don't. So, just to recap on this, the prime oil for digital giants are the billions of identities they mine to get to know in ever greater detail. And again, this scale problem is a big difference with the broadcast media age. Broadcast media companies were dealing at different levels of scale. You look at um, a popular newspaper in the UK, at the height of circulation, they might be selling 4 million copies a day. These companies deal with billions of users on a daily basis across the globe. The entire scale of what's going on here is vastly larger than anything that would have occurred in the broadcast media era. Even in countries where you would have limited numbers of broadcast media outlets and large populations. India or China, for example, where you can have audiences for things in the hundreds of millions. That's, that's piss poor. Those are rocky numbers compared to what these companies deal with. So the scale of what is happening here is far, far larger. These companies over the past 15 years have become so big that it is hard <coughs> to see without a mass leaving of a platform. Like we all decided to delete Instagram right now. Not just us. And, if us in this room decided to do it, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares about that. If every individual on the planet got rid of Instagram right now, yeah, okay. That might move something. That's also not going to happen. For the past 15 years, people have been waiting in particular for Meta to fail. Because the history of social media before that was of companies that would come along, do some good business for a while, and then collapse in on themselves. So you had like Friendster, then Bebo, then MySpace. Goes well for a couple of years, and then they collapse. The user just went somewhere else. What has happened in the past 15 years are these companies have become so big that there is nowhere else to go. You could say, well, what about TikTok? Well, yeah, TikTok's big. TikTok's big, but it's offering something very different and offering the same thing at the same time. TikTok will become so big that it will scramble out any innovation eventually, unless somebody comes and buys it, which I also think might happen in the next couple of years. The fact that Instagram now has Reels is... Yeah, and this is a classic Facebook thing. Any, anytime anything came along that was like, oh, this might be a little bit threatening, we're just going to steal that idea anyway. <laughs> so the early Facebook um, news feed was very different to what it looks now, because now it looks exactly like Twitter. They never put in the character uh, limit, but the design of it in 2008 was taken directly from Twitter. So Twitter started getting more and more users. Facebook thought, huh. Oh, we've got to steal this. And we did. <laughs> Instagram has stolen so many things from Snapchat over the years, it's not even funny. They offered to buy Snapchat in 2012, Snapchat turned it down. So what did they do instead? They just nicked all their ideas, <laughs> stole everything. In part from the one thing they didn't take from Snapchat, which was the kind of invisibility of Snapchat, that things would disappear over time. By the way, that's not even true. Snapchat keeps the record of everything you've ever posted. So if there's ever a data leak on Snapchat, there's probably a lot of people who are very, very well. Um, yeah, you know what I'm about. So, so when we adopt Foucault's argument here, really what I'm doing is trying to zero in on a very important point that Foucault makes, which is that power produces reality. Those 
bureaucracies that Foucault talked about when he was writing in the 70s and 80s created the reality of living in a state. The real conditions for everyday life were about how we fit in with the bureaucracies that we're expected to work with. Power today means that Meta, Alphabet, other big companies mediate our existence. They are the ones who provide the content but through which we understand the world. If most of the news that we get is from Instagram, that is mediated by the owners of that company. Their power is in how they produce reality to us. And really, the competitive advantages between them is about what reality do you prefer? Do you prefer Twitter's version of reality or Instagram's version of reality? Do you prefer TikTok's version of reality? Take your choice. They're all the same in that they're all there to capture your attention in order to turn you into a unit of economic value to be used, to be sold to other people. It's just bleak, isn't it? And it never occurred to me before that you're going to be really depressed after this. You know, go have a coffee, you know, have like a donut. Donuts are good, they make people feel better, you know. Or one of those, do you know those things, the, the twisty things with the toffee? You know those things I mean, they're like a stick? Oh god, they're good. No, 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 but they are, they're awesome curly whirlies, but when I was a kid they were like that fucking long, and now they're just rubbish. And plus I've got too many fillings now and they've kind of pulled my <coughs> So, the ver if you want a very short time way of understanding the shift of power over time, it's from analog to digital has been the move to platforms. That is the big shift in power. Each digital media company has a platform. We operate within those platforms and generate value through those platforms. If you want to think about how to describe it, each platform is a walled garden where activity of users can be measured in the minutest detail and you can use to create data profiles to be sold. Now, they're positioned as user-centered platforms. You know, Instagram's there for our benefit. You know, it'll tailor to our needs and wants and desires. But actually, it's tailoring to the desires and wants and needs of the shareholders of the company that owns that platform. And these have become, platforms have become part of our everyday lives. So, let's test this. There's a classic uh, example whenever I ask this question of what's called the Hawthorne effect. I will explain what the Hawthorne effect is after you answer the question. By a show of hands, please, when you wake up in the morning and roll over, by a show of hands, how many of you look at Instagram before doing anything else? Fucking liars. That is the Hawthorne effect. Okay, the Hawthorne effect says that people will not show <coughs> undesirable behaviours to somebody who thinks that they're undesirable. It's a classic uh, bias in psychological profiling. But well done to those that said that they do. Yes, you are honest. I could, I could spread it out to me. I could have asked about TikTok and maybe some others would have put their hands up. I could have said about WhatsApp perhaps and some others might have said the same thing if you do a lot of communication on that platform. I could have said it about YouTube. Some people do wake up in the morning and the first thing they put on is, is YouTube. You know? Me, what am I do first thing in the morning? You don't want to know. It's <laughs> um, <laughs> probably not best to go there. Um, it's, it's a form of digital media. Ingratiated into our everyday lives. The first thing we do in the morning is look at this, this and this and this. The first thing you do when I'm going to shut up in 15 minutes is get your phones out and go on Instagram. Right? That's what's going to happen. Yeah? Some of you are already doing it because you think I'm fucking blind or something and I can't see that you're looking at Instagram on your phone because, yeah, these, you know, these don't work. You know? um, it's okay. Sorry. Everyone needs a break. Every now and again. Um, fundamental parts of our everyday lives which are there to do this. And this means that the word social itself has become really problematic. This is social media. What is social about this business model? 
only to the extent that you have to communicate with others in order for it to be valuable. How you do it, what you do. So this, is like the, this is the big thing that people can't understand about Twitter. Right? We say, why doesn't Twitter ban all the right-wing people and all the Nazis? It's like, why would they do that? It makes so much money. Those people, with their controversial views, make so much money. It took Twitter years and years and years to ban Donald Trump. Not because anybody in Twitter likes Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a dick. Nobody likes Donald Trump. Donald Trump's own family doesn't like Donald Trump. It's got nothing to do with that. He was, made, he was generating traffic. Huge, huge amounts of traffic for that platform. They would have been idiot. I still think it was a really stupid decision on their part that they did get rid of him. If I was running that company, I wouldn't have. I, I saw my pay go down if I was running that company and I got rid of him. It's not generating as much money anymore. It makes perfect sense to me. You know, people say, oh, these vile people are on Twitter, they should be banned. Say, well, Twitter's not going to do that. You know, you can repeatedly see awful accounts on Facebook that people report and report and report. They don't get rid of. Well, yeah, that's because Facebook wants to make money. You're, 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 you are paying attention to these things. You know? Another line of thing at the moment is about TikTok. Inappropriate content on TikTok. Adult content on TikTok. Why isn't TikTok banning adult content? Guess why? People like watching that shit, all right? And it attracts people to the platform. Me, all right? I'm using me as a general sort of category of dick, all right? This is why TikTok is not getting rid of that stuff. But it's not a safe environment for kids. Well, it's not supposed to be. It's an environment to transform watching of things into data in order for it to be sold. If you understand what it's for, then you will stop asking silly questions, like why do people get rid of this? So, social media can be seen as online facilitators or enhancers of, social, of human networks, but, as a result of doing this, they become the generators of a vast data economy. Social media is almost the perfect mechanism by which you generate data of this kind. And this is the new, uh, new capitalism that we exist in. The attitudes towards this and the ownership of these platforms can be summed up in a very succinct kind of ideological position called the Californian ideology. This was proposed by... Um, Barbara and Cameron in 1995, and it's a very, very simple idea. You have two distinct forms of ideology going on here. One, hippies. Hippies in the 60s and 70s were like, yeah, just leave us alone, man. You know, we're the counterculture. We don't want to be ruled by government. We don't want to be hassled by police. We don't want to fall in this system. Hand in hand with rampant capitalism, which is we want to make as much money as we can in any way we see fit. Join those two things together. You have a group of people in charge of digital media companies who basically have two ideological positions. Let me do what I want and don't tax me. I want to do anything that I can, and I don't want to be prosecuted for it, and I also don't want to pay any taxes. I don't want to contribute towards society in any way, shape, or form. Thanks, guys. You're my hero. You don't want to contribute at all, but you also don't want to be governed at all. You want to exist effectively if you hold the Californian ideology outside of society. Society is not meaningful to somebody who holds this ideology. You want to exist outside of it. And this manifests itself in the kind of companies who make vast amounts of money from exploiting their users and then pay zero in corporation taxes. We already know this is largely the agreement that Amazon has with every government on the planet Earth. Which is why you know, Jeff Bezos isn't rich because Amazon makes a lot of money. Jeff Bezos is rich because he doesn't pay any fucking taxes. <coughs> but everything he earns is basically untaxed. I get really rich if I didn't have to give 40% of my money to the government every month. I'd have a lot more money, approximately 40% more money than I do at the moment. 
Bezos is the wealthiest man around because of this. Elon Musk the same. Elon Musk's companies are structured in a way that he doesn't pay any tax. You know, you might look, why can, how do you afford to pay 44 billion Twitter? Well, because he's fucking rich. Because <laughs> he doesn't pay any taxes. People often get confused about rich people, right? Rich people don't get rich because they make lots of money. They get rich because they keep their money. That's how you get rich. You don't get rich by earning loads, because if you earn loads and don't keep it, you're spendable. Rich people find ways of not spending it. That's how they become rich. Me, I'm done. I spend my money, so I'll never be rich. That's okay. I'm okay with that. You know, I can afford beer, the odd packet of cigarettes every now and again. You know, not too many, because, you know, I'm dying already. I don't need to die faster. Are we all clear on this? Okay. What this Californian ideology doesn't perhaps um, encompass clearly is what I call the brutal instrumentalization of all of this. And what that means, instrumentalization, is that we are transformed. We are made into instruments. Instruments to generate profit. It doesn't matter that we're human beings with feelings, you know, with interests, with intelligence. None of that matters. What matters is how valuable you are to the platform. That's all. How you can be monetized most effectively. Nothing about you is important. You might think, well, what if I died? Will I stop being valuable? Your activity can still be monetized in different ways. You can be used still. I mean, do you think Facebook doesn't sell dead people's profiles to advertisers? Yes. Unless that profile gets deleted, and a lot of them don't, they will still be bundling up all of that information. So there's no dignity in this, even in death, right? These companies undermine the American dream itself to a winner-takes-all mentality that crushes the possibility of any kind of competition and any kind of freedom. Bleak! I'm sorry. I'm sorry for depressing everyone the week before we study leave. It's not good, is it? We live in a big data society because of this. And as Dave Beer says, big data is central to the working of contemporary capitalism and a facilitator of neoliberalism, the background to market operations. So given this, you might question why we continue to consume social and digital media in this model. Now that you know about it, are you going to step away from it? No. And I wouldn't expect anyone to do that. Dave Arditi gives an answer to this. Arditi identifies that the operations of these companies have resulted in a new form of capitalism called unending consumption. The reason why we don't stop it's because there's always something new. We don't delete Instagram because there's always new content. We don't get rid of Spotify because there's always something new to listen to. We don't start watching YouTube because there's always new stuff. Always something new on TikTok. There's always something new on Netflix. Why don't you get... Netflix is shit, right? It's terrible. There's always something new to watch. You can't finish Netflix. So there's always something to watch there, even though most of us keep on watching the same show over and over and over again, because that's what we do on Netflix, is comfort TV, right? I can never finish it, I can never listen to everything on Spotify, I can never exhaust Instagram, I can never exhaust TikTok, I can never exhaust YouTube. There is an unending form of consumption here. We don't walk away because there's always something else to capture our attention. <laughs> And then we can be monetized all over again by that new thing that captures our attention. So Dave Arditi's unending consumption is a really interesting way to explain why. Even, I mean, you're not the first class of people who've been through this information. So why don't we walk away? Well, here's an explanation why. We're in a loop. An unending consumption loop. We can never break it. I mean, what Dave is saying is that we are in circuits of culture. There's a cybernetic loop going on. It's a continual production of new stuff. 
And this is how temperature operates unendingly. All of this jammed together is what Shoshana Zuboff called in 2019 the model of surveillance capitalism. All capitalistic endeavour is done by basically spying on us, finding ways to transform what we do, public and private, into data to be sold to other people. New, innovative ways all the time. If you have a smartwatch on, could you please raise your arm? Interesting. Not that many. What's the point of the smartwatch? Who could tell me why the smartwatch was invented? To keep track of time. To keep track of time. To keep track of time? That's a gloriously naive answer. I love it. <laughs> that is the best answer I've ever had to that question. I love that answer. This is why I have a Timex watch. Very understandable. To keep track of time. Perfect. Perfect. Apple didn't invent it. Apple never invents anything. They just copy what other people have invented. But let's take Apple's iWatch as an example of this. Apple as a company is involved in the mass data extraction from individuals who own its products. But Apple didn't have a way of extracting when you sleep what your resting heart rate is, or when you're active and when you're not. What times are you active at and where? Are you active? Again, GPS tracker in the watch. It's extracted an entirely new level of data about individuals. It knows who you are because you have an account. You can't use the iWatch without having an account. So you can link it directly to you, you can cross-reference it with all that stuff that you like to look at on all those different platforms. New level of data. Wonderful. This is Surveillance capitalism. Capitalism based on the observation of people all the time. Surveillance capitalism is not the same as digital technology itself. It is an economic logic that has hijacked the digital for its own purposes. The logic begins with unilaterally claiming private human experiences as free raw materials for production and sales. If once you're walking apart, once you're online browsing and communications, once you're hunt for a parking space, and once your voice at the breakfast table, what am I referring to with the voice there? Well, I'm not Shoshana Zuboff, is, but. Siri? Say again? Siri? How is, what do you mean? I mean, yeah. Go through that. <laughs> okay. So it knows who you're like, eating meals with? True. How would it know? What yeah. listens? Microphone. Where do you have them in your house? Alexas. Alexas. A giant global network of listening devices. It is wrong to think that there is some guy sat in a room somewhere listening to what you say to your Alexa. Or more importantly, what you don't say. Because when that little spinning light isn't on, you think Alexa's not listening. Always. Oh, it, it listens to everything. It is collecting that local information for processing algorithmically. There isn't somebody spying on you. Surveillance capitalism isn't about like a little guy sitting in a room somewhere looking at loads of screens. It doesn't work that way. Surveillance capitalism is about aggregating as much information about you as possible. And Alexa is part of that. So, the logic is not limited by companies because it is a logic. It is not something dictated by technology. So, the economy of mass media was closely related to leveraging audiences. Digital media giants are creators and aggregators of big data, and data systems intensify how we are surveilled. I'm going to skip through these. This, I was going to ask you about, but we're out of time. This is Elon Musk. Can anyone tell me why Elon Musk paid $44 million for Twitter? He was sued to buy it. Sure, but I think he could have saved himself money by just being sued. He probably would have only been sued by a quarter of that. All I did was he's free speech. 
does keep on banging on about free speech, Africana tech bro couldn't give a shit about free speech, I can assure you. Can anyone tell me why he paid 44 million, I mentioned earlier, there's 230 million daily users of Twitter. Why did he pay that money for that? He can sell the data. So he can sell the data for the users. Absolutely. It's, a really, it's, it's incredibly simple. He paid $44 billion for 230 million people's data, which he can analyze and commercialize. It's really, really straightforward. He wants to, like, you know, have people going into space and stuff, like, commercially. So if that ever happens, he has a platform to put ads on. He might want that, but yeah. It probably won't happen. Okay, before we go, you will remember I asked you a question. Why did you come, or why did you choose this course? Can I have a few answers, please? Well, I, I tell you a quick thing my background is. Um, I come here like because I'm having the same cost in Hong Kong and at the time we are going through the social movement and national security and I am actually a system of some political party in Hong Kong and and like I and after the national security law to the media in Hong Kong is shut down because they are against it. And I don't want to be a journalist that only speaking for the government and I have to limit it myself. That is an extremely noble reason for coming to this institution. It begs a certain question. There are hundreds of institutions that you could have gone to outside of Hong Kong. Why this one? Because the freedom. But why this one? There are many, many universities in the free world. The ranking here is higher. Than the ranking is higher here. For what? Yeah, for journalism, of course. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me let me park my scepticism. Can I have another answer, please? Somebody, somebody. We're not getting the fuck out of here until at least two other people give me an answer. So you better give me them now. Social media. Social media. Thank you. Somebody else. Creativity. Creativity. It's like a creative industry. This university is got something to do with the creative no. industry. No. Holy shit. Uh, I'm not liking what I hear. This is the point. I doubt that anyone here would have answered in this way. But it is absolutely what has happened to each and every one of you, especially you. You have all been pushed to Swansea University. You might not know it, but you have. Swansea University, guess what? is a customer of Meta, of Alphabet, of Amazon, and of Apple. They bought your data profiles. Everyone in this room, including lots of others as well, who didn't come here, right? you cast the net wide. Swansea University has been pushing at you for a long, long time. Each and every one of you. Some of you might be local. Okay. So Swansea University, there are several ways of doing this. <coughs> Communicating with you directly and indirectly. You know, there's advertising push both offline and online. But you would have got lots of information about this institution coming back years and years and years. He was targeted when he was 12. And was I? <laughs> <laughs> You start secondary school. When? No, that's when you were targeted. As soon as you start secondary school, Swansea University would have looked through profiles and data information that they would have picked up on social media and, well, not them, but the data aggregators that are working on their behalf, picking up your social inf media information and picking up information that's been sold by other services about you. Target here is an individual that can be pushed messages to be pushed towards this institution, just as you were. <laughs> just as everyone one of you has been targeted. <coughs> Your history of media use was analysed and aggregated by a data broker who then facilitated targeted advertising by your institution in order to get you to come to this institution. 
That makes you feel good, doesn't it? <laughs> They're doing it right now. Your younger brothers and sisters, they've targeted them. They've targeted everyone that they think will come to this institution. Every year, Swansea University is targeting millions of people around the globe to try and get them to come here. If it converts that into 10,000 enrolments, it's made a lot of money. Especially on the cost of this, which is very small per person. This is why you're here. You think you chose. You didn't choose. You were given a forced choice, maybe. But you weren't given a real choice. Certain institutions have targeted you and you have selected accordingly. Welcome to the real world. Um, no lecture next week. Make sure you have a look at assignment three and start working on that. If you need anything off me next week, I won't be in the country, but you can email me. Yeah, of course you can.